Starting off our list today, we have the small town of Fairfax, Virginia, with a population of 24,000 people and one bunny man. No, I'm not talking about some strange, unethical scientific experiment that broke the laws of both nature and the law and created some kind of bunny human hybrid situation. What I'm actually talking about is just a bit more grounded in reality. You see, what happened was in the early 1900s, an asylum in the town shut down after local residents caused an uproar over the amount of patients housed at the asylum, as well as its close proximity to their homes. The asylum complied with the wishes of the public by shutting its doors and sending its patients to live out the rest of their days elsewhere, more specifically, Lorton prison. On their way out of town, however, the bus carrying the now prisoners swerved and crashed by Fairfax Bridge and the then patients, now inmates, escaped. All were eventually located except one a patient named Douglas Griffin. And soon after the crash, police began finding skinned, half-eaten rabbits hung up along the bridge. It is also said that one night, a group of young people went out to explore the area and ended up meeting the same fate as the bunnies. Douglas was never found, and in 1970, almost 60 years after the bus crash, many people reported seeing a man in a white suit with bunny ears carrying a very sharp blade. Was it Douglas? A hoax? Or 60 years later, was is it some kind of copycat killer? Next up, we have Quitman, Arkansas. Apparently, y'all got a dog boy you gotta deal with out there. The story begins with a home built in 1890. Few different families lived there before the Bettises moved in. They were a family of three, Floyd and Aileen Bettis and their son, Gerald. Gerald was an absolute Error, especially to animals. Stories began to circulate about Gerald roaming the streets, gathering up stray cats and dogs, which he'd then torment to death. And he grew up to treat his own parents just as badly, keeping them locked away in the attic and even throwing his own father down the stairs at one point, killing him instantly. Gerald was arrested and died in jail, but that's not where his ghost is said to be. Families that have moved into the home since have reported strange strange things happening inside. First of all, it's said that pets just outright refuse to go into this house. Then there's the story of a contractor who came to work on the house and, and saw a large man with long brown hair carrying a cat by its neck, who then began rushing towards the contractor before vanishing into thin air. Many believe the home to be haunted by Gerald Bettis, aka the dog boy. Next, we are headed on up to Gary, Indiana, also known as a serial killer's playground. Once a thriving steel town known as the Magic City, Gary kind of fell off after the local industry began to decline in the 1990s due to competition overseas. Eventually, it turned into somewhat of a ghost town with over 10,000 abandoned and decaying houses far beyond repair lining its empty streets. As is with most abandoned places, the town quickly became a hot spot for arsonists vandals, cult gatherings, and even a serial killer by the name of Darren Van. Between 2013 and 2014, Darren ended the lives of seven different women by forcibly restricting their airways, and six of these women he hid throughout various abandoned homes in the town. The bodies remained hidden, and his crimes remained undetected until police found his final victim lifeless in a motel bathroom. To avoid the death penalty, Van made a deal. Instead of pleading guilty to the one one killing, the only killing police had evidence to charge him for, he would plead guilty to seven and bring the police to the homes in which the bodies were stashed to prove that he did in fact commit those crimes. He was instead charged with seven concurrent life sentences without parole. Next on the list is Ojai, California and the tale of the Char Man. Just south of Ojai lies Camp Comfort County Park, which is full of urban legends and ghost stories like tons. There's a, the ghost of a horsewoman. A headless motorcyclist, there's a vampire skeleton confined in a stone coffin. The list just goes on and on. There's stuff happening at this place. But one of the creepiest urban legends is the one they call Charman. So in 1948, there was a huge fire in the home of a father and his son. They were both horribly burnt before firemen arrived, and it took them a while to get there apparently, because by the time they did get there, the father was dead and the son had become completely deranged. He'd hung his father by his feet and skinned him. And the story goes that he just went crazy and then decided to do that. He was like, oh, I'm burnt! 
I gotta hang my father up and eat his skin. I don't know. I don't know why that was how it goes, but that's apparently how the story goes. He became then this charred, deranged monster and ran off into the woods and started living like Jason Voorhees. He'd come out and attack unsuspecting people. Charman is said to emit a horrible burning smell and only wears bandages over his burnt, peeling skin. Some say he's a ghost. Others say he survived for a while, living on his own in the woods as a deranged psycho, coming out of hiding on occasion to terrorize people. From the Golden to the Lone Star State, it's time to talk about the candy lady who resided in a small Texas town in the early 20th century. While having a candy lady in your area might sound like a pretty sweet deal, it really was the complete opposite for those living in this particular town. In fact, the candy lady is a story that apparently haunts people of Texas to this day. So who the hell is she? Well, she was a woman with a very sinister N.O. It is said that this woman would leave candy on her windowsills each night in an effort to lure young people over to her home. When they got close, she would snatch them up. During this time, many young members of the town were reported missing, and one farmer reported having found rotten teeth strewn along his fields. That is so gross. A sheriff had also been found with his eyes clawed out and his pockets stuffed with candy, and soon after, a young boy was found in a very similar state. If this doesn't tell you not to take candy from strangers, I really don't know what does. I just, I can't help you then. Now we move on to Ellicott City in Maryland. This town has a very unsettling urban legend, that of the Blink Man of Ilchester Tunnel, also known as the Flickergeist. Ilchester Tunnel is said to be haunted by the vengeful spirit of a homeless man who was hit by an oncoming train in the 1900s. Now, if you feel like it, you can summon Blink Man to haunt you rather easily. All you need to do is head to the tunnel at midnight, of course, it's always midnight, and stare into it for a whole hour. When 1 a.m. hits, it's said that you'll start to see the ghostly, tormented face of the Blink Man, and then every time you blink from that moment on, you'll see him creeping closer and closer to you when your eyes are closed. Now, personally, I wouldn't suggest doing this, even without the possibility of being haunted by a disgruntled homeless ghost the rest of your life. Just don't think it's a great idea to stand staring off into a tunnel in the middle of the night on active train tracks. Moving on up and over to Exeter, Rhode Island, home to many of history's New England witches, the first of which was executed in 1647. Fast forward to 1982, let's talk about the pure evil that is the final days of a young woman named Mercy Brown. Was she a witch or was she just educated? Or was she actually a vampire? Well, here's the thing. In her life, Mercy had watched both her mother and sister pass from tuberculosis, the same disease that Mary Mary suffered from leading up to her final day. Due to all the deaths surrounding Mary and the Brown family, the small town of Exeter began to believe that she might have been a witch, or were still a vampire. Why? No clue. What did they do about it? Well, after her burial, they dug her up and burned her heart and her liver to ashes, and then they force-fed those ashes to her surviving brother who died just two months later. If that's not dark enough, it is said that Mercy Brown's ghost still haunts the cemetery in which her decimated grave resides. Next on the list is Tagus, North Dakota. Now, Tagus has long been abandoned. It's a ghost town that once thrived in the 1900s. There's not a whole lot left of it now, just a handful of rundown homes, uh, and of course, a stairway to hell. At one time, there was a Lutheran church in the ghost town. It was burnt down in the early 2000s by hoodlums. The abandoned church was always said to be a real spooky place. Satan worshippers were said to practice dark rituals there. It's said if you stand in the exact spot where the church once stood, you can faintly hear screams coming from the souls that were once damned to hell. Other sights to see at the abandoned town of Tagus include, but are not limited to, a ghost train, which some have seen chugging along the old abandoned train tracks. Love the idea of a ghost train. Train, ghostly hellhounds, regular old ghosts, and ticked off local residents who may not be too pleased with mass amounts of people descending on the ghost town to catch a glimpse of the paranormal. 
From the stairway to hell in North Dakota to the gates of hell in Thornton, Colorado. What's next? Highway to hell in ACDC? Anyways, the gates are said to be located just off of Riverdale Road, a relatively short road in Thornton. But you know what they say, short road? Big scary mansion containing the gateway to hell. The mansion is said to have gained its entryway status after a man buried his wife, son, and daughters alive on the property. But these were not the first deaths to occur on the lot. In previous years, many people had been killed and strung up around the mansion as well. We are not sure if the madman responded responsible for all of these deaths was outright trying to summon the devil, but it appears that when you do that much evil in such a short amount of time, it just kind of happens. Along with the decrepit old mansion's gateway status, the ghost man's wife is said to haunt the property as well, along with a pack of ghost dogs. Many people who have attempted to visit the mansion have reported hearing whispers and screams, experiencing car trouble, feeling a chill, and seeing phantom vehicles and disappearing men on the road. Pretty creepy. I would not recommend going there. We're rounding out the list with the town of Cumberland. So this small town in Rhode Island has an urban legend that may have been part of the inspiration for Freddy Krueger in A Nightmare on Elm Street. So campers at Camp Curana Karana, couldn't figure out how to pronounce that. All you Camp Karana campers, let me know in the comments. But uh, people at this camp have told stories for decades, apparently going all the way back to the early 20th century. So the tale of Fingernail Freddy. Freddy was a farmer who lived in a small log cabin with his wife and children. He was a quiet man who kept mostly to himself, but little hoodlums were always running around on his land and messing with his crops. Well, one day Freddy just, he had enough. He decided he was gonna scare these menaces off his property once and for all by filling a shotgun with rock salt and firing at them. This did scare them off, but not for good. When Freddy was out in town, the young vandals returned and burned his house down, with Freddy's family still inside. Freddy returned to find his cabin engulfed in flames and tried to rush in to save his loved ones, getting severely burned in the process. So Freddy ran off into the woods, living a secluded life. But every once in a while, he'd come out to terrorize young boys at Camp Curana, a disfigured monster with a burnt face and incredibly long nails. All right, we're gonna start off our southern U.S. tour with the Yorktown Memorial Hospital in Yorktown, Texas. This place is haunted by two uh, very conflicting uh, types of entities, the ghosts of nuns, and then they have a demon with glowing red eyes that growls when people read from Bible verses. So it's gonna be a pretty contentious kind of living situation. Demons and ghostly nuns being forced to live alongside each other. Are they existing in, in some sort of like afterlife reality show or something? Like who cooked up this idea? Now, luckily this hospital is no longer operational. Uh, it seems like this would very stressful place to live, especially uh, if you're ill already. Even when it was in operation though, this would have been a freaky place to stay. Apparently there was one doctor, Dr. Norweski, or Norwiski, who was uh, practicing well into his 90s, and he even performed surgeries. Apparently a number of people actually died under his care as he got older, because they still let this frail old man perform surgeries on people. One story goes that the doctor was performing a surgery on this poor man's uh, thyroid, uh, and, the, and the doctor's hand slipped, because like he's 90 something. They're not really known for having steady hands. And then he accidentally just sliced the guy's throat and killed him. So his ghost haunts the place, the, the dead. Then you have the violent ghost nuns who will scratch people when they come in for tours, especially if they have tattoos. Next up on our list today, we have the southern state of Texas, which was at one time home to a very bad man who went by the name of Dean Coral, a man who remains to this day a very dark stain in the history books of Texas. The events that took place, the events that turned the town of Houston dark took place between 1970 and 1973, during which time the lives of at least 28 young men were ended at the hands of Coral. Originally born in Fort Wayne, Indiana, Coral moved to Texas with his mother after she divorced his father and remarried a traveling salesman. Sometime in the 1960s, Coral met a woman who he had fallen madly in love with and had even decided to propose, but to his surprise he was rejected and the relationship fell apart. A few years later, his mother's second marriage began to crumble as well, and despite Coral's efforts, the relationship also ended. Apparently, the events leading up to 1970 had taken quite a toll on Coral, as on September 25th of that same year, he committed his first known offense. Coral had taken a young man and ended his life. 
life. Shortly after, Coral took two more men against their wills and subsequently ended their lives. But this time he was caught in the act by a man who, in exchange for a green Chevrolet Corvette and a chunk of cash, became Coral's partner in crime, luring as many victims as he could into Coral's apartment. Eventually, another accomplice, Henley, was acquired by similar means. However, the partnership didn't last long, as on August 8th of 1973, Coral's life was ended at the hands of Henley, who yelled, we've gone too far before ending Coral's life with a handheld weapon. Next up, we have Sloss Furnaces in Alabama. This place was notorious for its horrible working conditions. And by that, I mean a lot of workers died here. It was a pig iron producing blast furnace that began operating in 1882. At the time, there were no government policies in place to protect workers, so things weren't great. Uh, they weren't paid a lot, and they usually worked very long hours while being forced into some pretty dangerous situations in order to get the job done. Workers weren't suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning. They were following into boiling pits of molten steel. Boiling and molten said both. Boiling and it's molten. It was very hot. They died instantly. The place just had danger around every corner, and every day these men were risking their lives. One of the worst deaths happened to a guy who got caught in a large flywheel, uh, so he accidentally got too close to it. It caught his clothing, and he was dragged into the gears, his body becoming less and less of a body each time the wheel turned. And presiding over all of this madness was the foreman known as Slag, apparently, and he was just as nasty as as his name sounds. He treated the workers like subhuman pawns. So it's no surprise that this place is said to be haunted by the workers who died there till this very day. Up next, we have Marymount Hospital in London, Kentucky, home to Hamilton, Ohio-born Donald Harvey, also known as the Angel of Death. Coming from a broken home where he was dropped as a child and continuously physically abused, Harvey by no means had an easy life. He was antisocial and quiet, which led to him being bullied a lot in school, leading him to eventually drop out. Later in life, Harvey obtained his GED and soon after began working as an orderly in Marymount Hospital in London. On May 31st of 1970, Harvey claimed the life of his first and second victims. The first was Logan Evans, whose life Harvey took in a bout of rage after the 88-year-old patient had rubbed feces on Harvey's face. The second was James Tyree, who died after Harvey accidentally gave the man the wrong catheter. On June 22nd of that same year, Harvey performed what he called his first mercy killing, holding the pillow over the face of Elizabeth Wyatt in what he described as an attempt to spare her from suffering. Harvey later went on to end the lives of at least 37 to 47 victims, although he claimed the number to be somewhere much closer to 90. He was arrested in 1971 for burglary and confessed to his crimes, but he was intoxicated and the police weren't buying it, so he was released on a petty theft charge. And it wasn't until 1987 that Harvey was first accused of murder after a biopsy on one of his patients showed signs of cyanide poisoning. Harvey pleaded guilty to 37 counts of murder and was sentenced to life plus 20 years in prison, where he was severely beaten and later died from his injuries. All right, let's talk about a haunted cemetery next. Stahl Cemetery in Kansas. I'm going to say the names of each of these states with the accent, by the way. Get used to it. All right, this may uh, be one of the most haunted cemeteries in the United States. That's because Stahl Cemetery is haunted by not just the ghosts of witches, uh, but satanic cults have gathered here to carry out rituals. There's also said to be a gateway to hell underneath the abandoned church right next to the cemetery, which has now been torn down. So now it's just an exposed gateway to hell on this piece of land. I, oh, and of course, Satan himself, also makes some appearances on occasion, especially on Halloween. So there's a lot going on in this place, none of it good, even without the witches and hell and Satan. At the end of the day, it's still a cemetery, so it's not the most joyous kind of place. Apparently, Stull Cemetery has such a reputation for evil that the Pope himself, uh, not sure which, but he refused to visit the place, claiming it was a demonic piece of land. I do wonder, though, if he was actually referring to this cemetery specifically, or if that was just a diss against Kansas in general. Uh, did the Pope have a thing against Kansas? Uh, is Kansas a demonic piece of land? I've never been, so someone please uh, leave your thoughts in the 
comments, shed some light on this if you're from Kansas, please. Next up, we've got the Cecil Hotel located in Los Angeles, Southern California. If you've seen American Horror Story, you're probably familiar with this one, and if you haven't, just know this place is terrifying enough to base an entire season of an award-winning horror series off of. The Cecil Hotel is infamous for having an incredibly large death toll, as well as a pretty ominous client base, including two known mass killers, Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, and Jack Underwaker. As for the deaths, there have been at least 16 sudden or unexplainable deaths that have taken place within the walls of the Cecil. From fallings, jumpings, pushings, and drownings, all the way to unknown disappearances. Those who have come and gone to the Cecil without so much as a scratch are most certainly among the favored. Due to the negative reputation, in 2011, the hotel was forced to change its name to Stay on Main in an effort to revamp tourism, but even this couldn't save it. In 2022, the Cecil closed its doors to all, except for its long-term residents, and handed the building over to the Skid Row Housing Trust, who now manages the property, which has become a privately funded, long-term, low-income housing property. Next up, we head to Georgia for a nice swim in Lake Lanier. Unfortunately, though, many who decide to swim in this lake are never seen again, so it's not really the nicest swim for some. Uh, this lake is pretty notorious for mysterious drownings. It seems to swallow people up year in and year out, but it's still a very popular vacation spot. Uh, in total, there have been 700 mysterious deaths on this lake, 200 of which have happened since 1994. Now, I'm sure you have your standard drownings here as well, but the oddest cases here are when people dive under the water and just never come back up. So what's going on in this place? Well, there are many who believe this lake to be haunted or cursed. So you see this lake, hasn't always been there. It was an artificially created lake, which was completed in 1956, but a lot of people lived on the land that now sits under the lake. Now, some places were torn down or moved, but there are still some homes and even a couple cemeteries that are still down there. Ghost town sitting at the bottom of a lake. So are the spirits of those whose graves were disturbed lingering at the bottom of the lake, dragging unlikely swimmers to the depths? Next on the list, we have the Queen Mary, also located in Southern California and also terrifying enough to earn itself a secure spot in television and film. The Queen Mary was in service from 1936 to 1936. 67, with its maiden voyage taking place on the 27th of May, 1936. The deaths of at least 49 individuals were recorded on the Queen Mary during its service in World War II, and it is now said that many of those who perished aboard the vessel can still be seen roaming its halls to this day. On May 8th of 1971, after undergoing some serious refurbishing, the Queen Mary was opened to the public as a hotel that allowed visitors to explore its original porthole adorned walls. Certain rooms aboard the ship have been said to be much more active than others in regards to ghost sightings, including stateroom B340, where Walter J. Adams took his final breath in 1948, after which guests of the room have reported having their sheets ripped off their bodies in the middle of the night, lights and sinks turning on and off, knocking on the walls, and even sightings of the man. The boiler room is another in which several guests have reported seeing a young woman holding a doll and sucking her thumb. And of course, we can't forget the first class swimming pool, which is said to be home to many different apparitions with sightings ranging from women in wedding gowns to very young people in suits and dresses. Next up, we head to Arkansas with the Crescent Hotel and Spa in Eureka Springs. This is said to be one of America's most haunted hotels and spas. The place has a very dark history, and that has a lot to do with a man named Dr. Norman Baker, but we'll get to him in a bit. So at first, just during the hotel's construction in 1885, an Irish stonemason fell to his death from room 218, and this room has since become a hotbed of spiritual activity. Known as Michael, the ghost in room 218 has been labeled a poltergeist, an Irish poltergeist. Not the most lucky man in the world. Guests who have stayed in room 218 have reported seeing hands emerging from the bathroom mirror, the sound of a falling man in the ceiling. Uh, our, our boy, your 
rolling around up there, doors opening and slamming shut mysteriously. But who's this Dr. Norm Baker, you ask? Well, in the 1930s, the hotel became an experimental cancer hospital, and Baker, who claimed to be a licensed physician, would do examinations in the basement, charging families large amounts of money to do so. Well, as it turns out, the guy wasn't even a licensed doctor. He was a quack claiming to have found a cure for cancer. And as you can probably imagine, there are a number of ghosts that haunt the place who were under his quote unquote care. Uh, there's the apparition of a nurse pushing a gurney in Dr. Baker's old morgue area, creating eerie noises as it moves down the hotel halls. There's also the laundry room located next to Dr. Baker's morgue. Washers and dryers mysteriously will turn on in the middle of the night. And housekeepers have reported meeting Theodora in room 419, who introduces herself as a cancer patient of Dr. Baker's and then vanishes. And finally, we have the Louisiana State Penitentiary located in Louisiana, also known as America's goriest prison. The penitentiary is the largest maximum security prison in all of America, and its history is draped in heinous crime, racism, and brutality. At one time, the prison held 3,712 inmates serving life sentences and had an average death rate of about 32 inmates per year who passed due to violent acts, overdose, illness, or self-inflicted harm. Due to medical care in the United States being so expensive, when an inmate became injured or ill, they rarely got the chance to see a licensed doctor, as the prison had a habit of hiring doctors with suspended or even revoked licenses as a way to cut down on costs. The inmates who were forced to perform physically strenuous labor for just pennies a day were given no recreational time other than a short window in which they were allowed to exercise in small, individual cages with no equipment that have been compared to dog cages. The prison's death row is also said to be the most haunted place on the grounds. While inmates are now euthanized by lethal injection, at one point in time the inmates had been sentenced to death via electric chair. Unfortunately for those destined to meet this fate, the prison's only electric chair didn't always work the way it was supposed to, often shorting out and just torturing the inmates. When this would happen, the prison would repair the chair, nicknamed Gruesome Gertie, and send the inmates back to their deaths on that very same chair. While this is nowhere near the full list of this particular prison's many atrocities, I think with this information alone, it's very safe to say that this place is absolutely nothing less than pure evil. All right. So Joe Ball was a serial killer. He has a couple interesting nicknames, the Butcher of Elmendorf and the Alligator Man, both of which fit. He fought in World War I, and when he returned to Texas, he started making money as a bootlegger. Then when Prohibition ended, he opened a saloon. At the back, he built a pond where he kept six alligators. He'd often feed live cats and dogs to the gators, but that didn't satisfy him for long. Soon, women in the area started going missing including his own wife. Now in 1938, two county sheriffs arrived at his property to question him about several of these missing women, and Ball pulled out a pistol and took his own life. But a handyman of Joe's, Clifford Wheeler, told authorities about how he'd assisted Ball in disposing of the bodies of two women who he'd killed, feeding them to his alligators. It's believed Joe Ball may have taken the lives of at least 20 women. Next up, we have a small town in Texas that was once home to a lesser known but incredibly gruesome serial killer, Henry Lee Lucas, who claims to have killed over 3,000 individuals during his criminal career, which spanned from the 1960s all the way into the 1980s. Also known as the Confession Killer or Highway Stalker, Lee Lucas was born in Blacksford, Virginia, and at a young age lost his father to hypothermia, and so his mother was forced to raise him on her own. Clearly, Henry wasn't happy with this as his mother was the first person he killed in 1960 in Michigan. He was sent to prison but only served 10 years due to overcrowding. And that's when he moved to Ringgold, Texas with his niece Frida Powell to work for a sick woman named Katie Rich, both of whom he would later kill. While he claimed to have ended the lives of thousands of individuals through restricting airways, impaling them with sharp objects, blunt force, and hit and runs, he was convicted of only 11 killings. Texarkana is home to one of the creepiest cases in the state's history, the Texarkana Moonlight 
killer case. So this case was heavy inspiration for slasher movies that would come years later, along with tons of urban legends. The killer literally wore a sack with holes cut out for his eyes and would attack innocent couples while their cars were parked in an area called Lover's Lane. It's about as classic as it gets. So the first attack happened on February 22nd, 1946. A young couple, Jimmy Hollisand and his girlfriend Mary Jean Larry, were attacked by a man with a pillowcase over his head carrying a firearm. Jimmy was pistol whipped and very injured and Mary was attacked but the two lived. Many of the other victims wouldn't be so lucky though. He would attack six other people and it all happened in a period of 10 weeks. The assailant became known as the Phantom of Texarkana and the case was never solved. Regular hospitals are bad enough, but abandoned and haunted hospitals definitely take the cake, so of course we had to include at least one on today's list. The Yorktown Memorial Hospital located in Yorktown, Texas, between San Antonio and the Gulf Coast. It was built in 1951 to house and treat those suffering from substance abuse. When the hospital was abandoned in 1980, the living residents and staff members exited the building. But what about those who died during their time in the hospital? Well, it's said that they still inhabit the premises to this day. And no, I'm not talking about one or two patients who died while under the hospital's care. I'm talking about thousands, over 2,000 to be exact. So really, it's no wonder the place is extremely haunted. Honestly, I'm surprised it didn't open up some kind of gateway to hell and land a spot on the list in our last video. Check it out if you'd like. Those who have entered the building have reported feeling a strange, rotting sensation and claim that they can feel the tormented soul's energies in the walls. Not only that, but many people have said they've heard screams and disembodied voices while inside, as well as seeing strange floating lights in the hallways, despite the fact that the building is ancient and has no electricity. If you've been, let me know your experience. Now we move on to Kerrville, Texas with the case of Janine Jones, a nurse who also terrorized San Antonio. What? An absolute creep this woman is. Yes, she is still alive. She took the lives of an estimated 60 young patients in her care between 1970 and 1982. She'd inject patients with a variety of substances that would cause cardiac arrest. She first started working as a licensed vocational nurse at Bexar County Hospital in San Antonio in the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit. But hospital staff started realizing that an abnormal amount of young patients were dying in Jones's care. Now, here's where things get really infuriating. An investigation could have been carried out right there and then, and things could have ended here. But the hospital didn't want any negative attention, and they certainly did not want to be sued. So instead of alerting authorities, they asked all of their current LVNs to resign, and then rehired exclusively registered nurses to take control of the pediatric ICU. This meant that Jones could just move on and start working at another hospital, which she did. So more young patients died at her hands at a pediatric pediatrician's clinic in Kerrville. There, a doctor finally found she'd been accessing lethal amounts of succimethonium chloride. So in 1985, she was finally convicted and is now serving life in prison. Circling right on back to Yorktown, it appears as though this particular town is home to not only an incredibly haunted hospital, but also an incredibly disturbing creature known as a Wendigo. Although the creature is best described in Algonquin folklore, which is Canadian for my Americans on this channel, Many locals of the town claim to have seen one of the beasts. Many people have compared the Wendigo to a skinwalker as it is tall and lanky and somewhat humanoid but can shapeshift and has been known to devour human flesh. And when a Wendigo finds the body of a deceased hiker, it will often inhabit it and then turn to killing those who attempt to come into contact with its human exterior. Many people also claim to have seen the demon take the form of animals and follow and stalk them throughout the area. Stay safe out there in Wendigo. Speaking of creepy creatures, Texas is also home to an entity known as Goatman, who stalks the old Alton Bridge, connecting Denton and Copper Canyon. So the tale traces back to a black goat farmer named Oscar Washburn, who would moved his family near the bridge. And Washburn earned a reputation as a very reliable businessman and was nicknamed the Goatman by locals. He even hung a sign on Alton Bridge pointing towards his home, proudly declaring this way to the Goatman. But in 1938, members of the local government 
Wright, who had ties to the Ku Klux Klan, kidnapped Washburn from his family. They took him to the bridge, hung a noose around his neck, and threw him over the side. When they looked down, expecting to see him dead though, they found the noose completely empty. Now, locals warn that crossing the bridge at night without headlights, just as the Klansmen did, will summon the Goatman. People crossing the bridge will claim to spot ghostly figures, mysterious lights coming from the woods, and even physical encounters like being touched, grabbed, or having rocks thrown at them from some unseen force. Or of course, a half man, half goat monster. Next up, surprise, surprise, it's another creepy hospital. Worley Hospital in Pampa, Texas. The institution was opened in 1928, but closed its doors in the 1970s due to lack of revenue. After 40 years of sitting abandoned, the building has become quite a talking point for the town's locals, who claim that it is haunted by patients who died within its walls during its 42 years of operation. After many townspeople reported seeing a black silhouette in the window of the abandoned building, ghost hunters began to take interest. Those who have entered have been greeted with decrepit and decaying walls, ceilings and floors that have been heavily vandalized, but it appears as though trespassers aren't the only ones to make their way through the empty halls of the once surgically specialized facility. Many of the patients who died within the building's walls, as well as a 25 year old nurse who was poisoned while working at the hospital, are said to roam the grounds. People have have reported seeing demonic creatures stalking them while exploring the floors of the hospitals, with the majority of the activity taking place on the third floor where surgeries would have been performed when the hospital was running. Oh, and the current owner of the grounds wants to renovate the building into a ministry. Coincidence? I do not think so. League City, Texas is home to an area known as the Killing Fields. So there is an abnormally large list of people who have been found dead in this stretch of land surrounding Interstate Highway 45. And there are also a number of people who have gone missing from this area and have still yet to be found. And out of more than 30 cases, only a small handful have ever been solved. The place is such a hot spot for mysterious deaths that a task force operates Operation Halt was set up just to investigate these incidents alone. The first cases started cropping up in the 70s with the discovery of multiple bodies scattered throughout the area and over the decades, law enforcement agencies have recovered the remains of numerous people, many of them young women. And it's not even clear if there's just one assailant responsible, a group, or if the area is just an ideal spot to kind of get rid of evidence. We really don't know. It's a complete mystery to this day. And finally, we have a man with a thing for eyes. Stealing them, that is. It all started in the 1990s in a rural area of Dallas. Is it a town? Not really, but this case is pure evil, so listen up. During the 90s, SEX workers began turning up dead at an alarming rate. With one very striking thing in common, you guessed it, their eyes had been completely removed from their sockets. The killer was Charles Albright, also known as the eyeball killer. When he was young, Charles had quite the knack for taxidermy. He would stuff many animals a week, doing his best to make them look pristine, but there was one thing missing, eyes. His mother refused to buy glass eyes for the animals, and so instead, Charles would use buttons. When he got a little older, he slept with an SEX worker, which led to him getting a transmitted infection. I feel like the pieces are starting to come together. His obsession with the eyes and his hatred for women of this certain profession grew exponentially over the years, and on December 13th of 1990, he took his first life. After violating the woman, he fired a projectile from a handheld weapon execution style into the back of her head and carefully removed the eyes of the victim with what has been described as surgical precision. Charles was convicted of one killing but most likely committed at least three. He was sentenced to death and was executed in August of 2022. Shepherdstown, West Virginia is arguably one of the most haunted places in America, according to those who have visited the town and experienced its dark paranormal atmosphere. The town was actually formed long before America became a country. Well, 46 years at least. And it was originally named Mecklenburg, but that changed when Thomas Shepard obtained the land in 1734. It's considered a historic Civil War area as just three miles up from the town, the Antietam Battle, the most gruesome battle of the Civil War, was fought. A hotel in the town is also home to some pretty dark deaths. In one instance, a man took his own life after losing a card game. In another, a young man was killed 
for winning. Both men are said to roam around the hotel and many claim to hear the younger of the two crying out for his mother as he did during his last living moments. But perhaps the most famous sighting in the town is that of a dark shadowy figure that lurks in the clock tower after dark. Oh, and the bakery is also haunted, with almost anyone who enters it claiming to have felt the sensation of hands pushing up against them and hearing whispered conversations in the waiting area despite being completely alone. Next on the list we have Dingus in Mingo County. Love that name, Dingus. This is a very small and remote community. There are under 2,000 residents and one of the things that makes this place really interesting is that one of the only ways to access the town is through a mile long, very narrow, one lane tunnel, which can be aggravating at the best of times I imagine and very dangerous at the worst. But Dingus also has a pretty dark history. It was a railroad and mining town at one time and it was one of the most lawless places in the state. Lawmen struggled to keep order and shootouts between police and outlaws was pretty common. And one thing the residents did not take kindly to were outsiders, and a lot of this was racially motivated. It wasn't uncommon for immigrants to be met with armed townspeople at the other end of the tunnel who would use very aggressive methods to keep them away. A lot of dark things happened at Dingus Tunnel, not just from violence like this, but accidents as well, like train collisions. So aside from all the dark history, it probably comes as no surprise that many locals claim the tunnel to be quite Haunted. Next up we have the Weston Asylum. You know we had to have at least one asylum on our list. It's classic. Back in the mid 1800s, the town of Weston was home to the controversially named trans Eleni Lunatic Asylum. It was used to house and treat the mentally ill of the time. However, that pretty much meant anyone whose opinion opposed those in positions of authority or women who sometimes cried. But I digress. While the exact number of deaths that occurred on the grounds remains unknown, local historians and state hospital expert Titus Swan has estimated the number to be in or above a five figure range, meaning that at least 10,000 people died in the hospital. So like no wonder this place is super haunted. I mean, I think we know what kind of torment went on in those places back in the day. Not only that, but this particular asylum was often overcrowded, meaning that even without what would today be considered gross misconduct, the living conditions were already pretty bleak. Today, those those who enter the once abandoned building that has since been reopened to the public as a historic landmark have reported feeling a sense of extreme dread, seeing mysterious shadowy figures roaming the halls, and hearing the disembodied helpless screams of patients past. Next up we have Sheep Squatch of Boone County. I'm kind of cheating here with this one, adding a whole county to the list. Uh, but the creature has been spotted all throughout the place, so I kind of had to. The Sheep Squatch also sometimes referred to as the white thing, is described as a large, woolly, furred monster with goat horns and razor sharp teeth. Sightings of the creature started being reported in Boone throughout the 90s, beginning in 94, when two youngsters spotted the strange creature while playing in their yard. Now, what I find interesting about these reports is that the creature is always described as having white fur. Now, why do I find this interesting? Well, with Bigfoot sightings, there's usually a chance people could be misidentifying a bear. Whereas here, like what animal is there the size of a bear with white fur? Polar bears, but they're not really roaming around West Virginia. The creature was spotted again in 1995 by a couple driving down a road in Boone County. They spotted a large white furred animal sitting in a ditch. They didn't know what it was, so they stopped to look. Then it raced towards them. They sped out of there, but found large scratch marks on their car once they made it back home. If you're gonna do an asylum, you might as well do a prison, specifically the West Virginia Penitentiary located in the small town of Moundsville. The prison opened its doors in 1863 after West Virginia split from just Virginia, becoming its own state. During its 119 year operation, some pretty dark stuff went on inside of its walls, which earned the prison a spot on the United States Department of Justice's top 10 most violent correctional facilities list. The recreational area of the prison, located in the basement, often saw various forms of illegal activity, including assault, violation assault, substance abuse, and even killings. At any given time during the penitentiary's operation, 
cooperation between six and 700 inmates were held on the grounds. But even still, the prison was highly overcrowded, with inmates often having to sleep on the floor. And over the years, the property saw almost 1,000 deaths. Many people believe that those who died within the prison never actually left. In fact, many visitors to the grounds have seen and even photographed the shadowy figure of a man that roams the halls. And the staff working on the premises of what is now a historical site have reported being accosted while on the job. Oh, and remember the basement? Many people have claimed to have heard screams coming from its depths, but most are far too scared to go down and check it out. In the town of Princeton sits the Lake Shawnee Amusement Park. Unless you live in Princeton, West Virginia, or are a paranormal enthusiast though, you've probably never heard of the place. It's not much of a tourist destination anymore because it's been abandoned since 1988. It's said that the park was built on cursed land. And that's not just because people have seen specters lingering around the park, it's because there were tragic deaths at the park and the place was built on land with some pretty dark history. There was a massacre on this land back in 1785. The landowner, Mitchell Clay, had lost two of his sons to a Native American raiding party and sought revenge. He gathered up a bunch of locals and attacked them right back. Then, in 1926, a man named Conley Trigg Snydow Sr. decided the land would be a perfect spot for a theme park. Over the years, there were two drownings in the pool. The park was also closed for a time after a failed health inspection. Then a former employee of the park bought the land in 1988, but was forced to close it down again just a year later because of increased insurance rates. So not the best luck for this place. And now the old structures like the Ferris wheel and swing ride stand eerily unused, coated in rust and haunted by ghosts, so they say. This next one is pretty sad, but also pretty remarkable. In 1897 in Greenbrier County, and I can do a county because James did a county, so if we go down, we go down together. Anyways, in 1897 in Greenbrier County, Zona Shu was found dead. A funeral was held and Zona was laid to rest, but she couldn't rest, and so Zona's spirit visited her mother and explained to her that she had not died in the way everyone assumed she had, but instead she had been killed by her husband, who had been routinely aggressive throughout their entire marriage. Upon learning this information, Zona's mother demanded that her daughter's body be dug up and re-examined. And sure enough, upon closer inspection, it became clear to the prosecutor that Zona's neck had been broken. Her husband was arrested for the crime, and the city even installed a plaque recognizing Zona's ghost's involvement in the conviction of her killer. The town of Harper's Ferry is said to be teeming with paranormal activity. In fact, it's said to be the most haunted town in the state. Harper's Ferry played a big role in the Civil War, and a lot of both Union and Confederate soldiers died here. In September of 1862, an estimated 13,000 soldiers died at the Battle of Harper's Ferry. There were also a number of raids, one of which was led by John Brown, who's said to haunt the town to this day. Some also say that on some nights you can hear the ghostly sounds of drummers marching their way down High Street. And there's also the tale of screaming Jenny. So Jenny had no family, no home. She lived in an abandoned storage shed by the Harper's Ferry Railroad. One fall night, Jenny sat huddled by a fire, and then a spark leapt up from the fire landing on her clothes, which began to catch fire. She was too cold and weak to notice before it was too late. She started screaming and rushed down the train tracks for help. Now, here's the thing, when you're on fire, uh, your, your vision is kind of blocked by light already, so she did not see the two glowing lights of a train rushing right towards her, and she was flattened by the train. Ever since this incident, on particularly cold autumn nights, some say they can hear the sounds of screams coming from the train tracks. Conductors have even seen a glowing figure flailing in the night, only to vanish into thin air once the train gets up too close. Next up we have the Parkersburg North Bend Rail Trail. I'm not sure if that's a tongue twister or the title of an adult movie. But anyways, in the daytime the trail is quite lovely and pretty serene. A great place to go for picnics and lunch dates. However, I suppose if your lunch date is at a park, it's already a picnic. 
Anyways, you could also go for breakfast, but I wouldn't recommend you go at night. Why? Because it's haunted. Well, part of it is at least. Specifically, the 1,300 foot long tunnel that can be found along the trail aka tunnel number 19. It is said that a woman wearing a white dress walks mournfully around inside of its dark walls. The legend goes that she was a bride, riding on a train with her groom when she was pushed off and died beside the tracks. People in the area have also reported having found human bones in abandoned houses nearby, but that's an entirely different mystery for another day. And finally, we have the town of Grafton, which is famous for one of the strangest cryptids in the United States, the Grafton Monster, which was first spotted in 1964 by a reporter named Robert Cockrell. He described the creature as this large, seven to nine foot tall beast with white skin and no visible head. He was driving home from work late at night when he spotted the creature in the middle of the road. They raced home, then gathered two of his friends to come back to the site to investigate. The creature was gone, but they claimed to have come across large footprints, and they also heard a strange, low, bellowing whistle sound in the distance. The next day, dozens of calls started coming into the local newspaper, with people reporting to have spotted a similar looking creature, and that's when Cockrell decided to write his article. Reports that the cryptid started dying out by the end of that summer in 1964, but there's still sporadic sightings here and there. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Waverly Hills Sanatorium. The Waverly Hills Sanatorium in Louisville, Kentucky is a former tuberculosis hospital that is said to be one of the most haunted places in the United States. The hospital was operational from 1910 to 1961 and housed thousands of patients suffering from tuberculosis during that time. The building's dark history, which includes reports of medical experiments, neglect, and mistreatment of patients, has led to numerous reports of paranormal activity. Visitors to the abandoned abandoned hospital have reported hearing strange noises, feeling cold spots, and even seeing ghostly apparitions, including the ghosts of former patients and nurses. The most famous ghostly sighting at Waverly Hills is that of a nurse who is said to have taken her own life in one of the hospital's rooms. Her ghost has been seen by many visitors and is said to be one of the most active spirits in the building. The sanatorium's eerie atmosphere and dark history continue to attract ghost hunters and paranormal enthusiasts from around the world. In our number nine spot today, we have the Prince Edward Heights Mental Hospital. The Prince Edward Heights Mental Hospital, located in Prince Edward County in Ontario, was a psychiatric hospital that operated from 1913 to 1999. The hospital was known for its very controversial treatments and overcrowding, and there are many stories of patient mistreatment and harm. When the hospital closed, it left behind a dark and eerie legacy. The abandoned hospital has become a popular spot for urban explorers and paranormal investigators with many reports of strange noises, unexplained occurrences, and ghostly apparitions. Some of the most commonly reported sightings include the ghostly figure of a former patient who is said to roam the halls, as well as the sound of footsteps, screams, which is horrifying, and other unexplained noises. Visitors to the hospital have reported feeling an overwhelming sense of sadness and despair, and many believe that the spirits of former patients still haunt the abandoned building today. In our number 8 spot today, we have Bannock. Bannock, Montana is a ghost town that was once a bustling gold mining community in the late 1800s. Today, however, the town is a popular destination for ghost hunters and urban explorers due to its reputation for being haunted. Visitors to Bannock have reported seeing ghostly apparitions, hearing unexplained noises, and feeling a very strong spiritual energy throughout the town. Some of the most commonly reported sightings include the ghostly figure of a former sheriff who was killed in the line of duty, as well as the ghost of a girl who was said to have died from illness in one of the town's homes. Others have reported feeling a strong sense of unease and fear, particularly in the town's abandoned schoolhouse. Very creepy. While the exact reason for Bannock's haunting remains a mystery. Many believe that the town's violent past, which includes the numerous killings and deaths that occurred in its heyday, have left behind a lingering spiritual energy that continues to haunt the town today. In our number 7 spot today, we have the CPR Hospital. The abandoned CPR Hospital is located in Saskatchewan here in Canada, my home province, and it's a different kind of CPR than you might be thinking. In its past life, this hospital was once a hospital 
hospital for Canadian Pacific Railway workers in the early 1900s. The hospital closed its doors in the 1980s and has been abandoned ever since. Today, the hospital is a popular spot for ghost hunters and urban explorers, with many reports of strange occurrences and ghostly sightings. Visitors to the hospital have reported hearing strange noises, including the sound of footsteps and the disembodied voices of former patients and staff. Some have even reported seeing apparitions, including the ghostly figure of a former nurse who died in a tragic accident. The hospital's haunting history is thought to be linked to the many tragedies that occurred during its time as a working hospital. Whether or not the hospital is truly haunted remains up for debate, but its eerie atmosphere and mysterious past continue to draw visitors from far and wide. In our number six spot today, we have Bodie. Bodie, which is located in California, is a former mining town that is now a ghost town and state historic park. The town was established in 1859 and was the home to a thriving gold rush community until the early 1900s when the mines began to close. The town's isolation and very harsh living conditions made it a very difficult place to live and it was eventually abandoned. The remaining buildings, which have been preserved in a state of quote, arrested decay, make it a popular spot for tourists and ghost hunters alike. Visitors to Bodie have reported hearing strange noises, feeling cold spots, and even, of course, seeing a ghost or two. Some believe that the town's violent history, which includes shootouts and executions, has caused it to become haunted. Others believe that the spirits of former residents still roam the streets, unable to let go of their former lives. Bodie's haunting history and well-preserved buildings make it a fascinating but very eerie place to visit. In our number five spot today, we have Val Jalbert. The abandoned village of Val Jalbert, located in Quebec, Canada, was once a thriving pulp mill town in the 1920s. However, after the mill closed in the 1940s, the town was abandoned and left to decay. Today, the village is a very popular spot for tourists and explorers, with many reports of strange occurrences and ghostly sightings. Visitors to Val Jalbert have reported feeling a sense of unease and hearing strange noises, including whispers and footsteps. I think that whispers is like the worst. No, voices is one thing, whispers is worse. There are also rumors of a ghostly figure that haunts the village's church, as well as other apparitions that have been spotted throughout the abandoned buildings. Many people believe that the town's tragic history, which includes a devastating fire and several deaths, has caused it to become haunted. The abandoned village of Val Jalbert is a fascinating and eerie place to visit, and its haunting history and ghostly tales continue to intrigue visitors from around the world. In our number four spot today, we have Six Flags New Orleans. Six Flags New Orleans, of course, located in Louisiana, was once a very popular theme park that closed its doors after Hurricane Katrina devastated the area in 2005. Since then, the park has been abandoned and left to decay, leading many to believe that it is haunted. Visitors to the park have reported hearing strange noises and seeing ghostly apparitions, including the ghost of a former employee who is said to have died on the property. There are also rumors of ghostly figures that can be seen walking through the abandoned park at night. While many of the park's attractions have been dismantled at this point, some of the structures still stand, including the abandoned roller coasters and the very creepy dilapidated clown head that once served as the park's entrance. The park's haunting history and eerie atmosphere have made it a very popular destination for urban explorers and ghost hunters alike. However, visitors are warned that the property is unsafe and trespassing is strictly prohibited. In our number three spot today, we have the Central Experimental Farm. Located in Ottawa, Ontario, this farm is a research facility that has been in operation since 1886. However, despite its scientific purpose, the farm has a reputation for being haunted. Visitors to the farm have reported seeing ghosts, hearing unexplained noises, and also feeling an eerie presence. Some of the most commonly reported sightings include the ghostly figure of a former farm worker who died on the property, as well as the ghost of a woman who is said to haunt the farm's historic farmhouse. There are also rumors of a ghostly horse-drawn carriage that can be seen driving through the farm's fields. While the exact reason for the farm's haunting remains unknown, many believe that the many tragedies that have occurred on the property, including accidents and deaths, have left behind a lingering spiritual energy. The Central Experimental Farm is a fascinating and eerie location, and its haunting history and the ghostly tales surrounding it continue to intrigue 
intrigue visitors from around the world. In our number two spot today, we have Centralia. Located in Pennsylvania, this town is often referred to as one of the gateways to hell. That is due to the fire that spread in an underground coal mine underneath the town in 1962. The fire, which is believed to have been started by a trash fire that spread to the coal seam, has been burning for over 60 years and has caused the town to be evacuated due to toxic fumes and the risk of collapse. As the fire still blazes underground, it causes the smoke and poisonous gases to rise up from the ground, not only causing an eerie appearance, but also a very serious health hazard. The temperatures can be so hot in the area that one guy's backyard was measured at 626 degrees Fahrenheit. Sometimes the fire will also burn through supports underground, which in the end turns into a sinkhole. This has caused pets, wildlife, and residents to unsuspectingly get swallowed up into the hole. In 1984, the US government ordered a total evacuation of the town, but a handful of residents refused to leave and even went to court over their right to stay in the town for as long as they live. The abandoned buildings, cracked and buckled roads, and just eerie silence makes it a popular spot for urban explorers and paranormal enthusiasts. Some believe that the town's dark history combined with the ongoing fire has caused the area to become haunted. Finally, in our number one spot today, we have the Eastern State Penitentiary. The Eastern State Penitentiary, located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, is known for its haunting history. The prison was operational for almost 150 years from 1829 until its closure in 1971, and it was once the home to some of the country's most notorious criminals, including Al Capone. The prison's imposing gothic architecture and innovative design, which placed an emphasis on solitary confinement and rehabilitation, made it one of the most famous prisons of its time. However, its harsh conditions and notorious history also make it a popular spot for ghost hunters and people who love all things paranormal. Visitors have reported hearing strange noises, feeling cold spots, and even seeing ghosts, including the ghost of a guard who was killed by an inmate. Some even claim to have been touched or pushed by unseen forces. The prison's eerie atmosphere and dark history continue to fascinate as well as frighten visitors to this day. Starting off this countdown, we have Six Flags in New Orleans. Six Flags is a huge American park corporation with parks all throughout the US, but sadly the one in New Orleans has been abandoned. The park opened in 2000, but only lasted a couple of years. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit the park and the property flooded. The whole park was submerged in seven feet of water for about a month. The exposure to this water damaged a lot of rides, making them unsafe. There wasn't enough funding for all the repairs that they had to do, so the park was closed. Now it's only used as a film set. In fact, the film Deepwater Horizon and Jurassic World have both filmed scenes there. Moving on to number nine, we have the Land of Oz. Located in North Carolina, the Land of Oz was a park centered around the Wizard of Oz. It first opened in 1970 and featured a beautiful yellow brick road and had an emerald city and even had one of the dresses Judy Garland wore in the film. However, the buzz surrounding this place quickly died down. Then in 1975, there was a fire at the park that destroyed the emerald city. And then Judy Garland's dress was stolen. By 1980, the entire park was abandoned. Now you can only visit the park once a year as part of a Halloween attraction. In our 8th spot, we have Jungle Habitat. Located in West Milford, New Jersey, the Jungle Habitat Amusement Park allowed guests to get up close and personal with the animals. You could do this by walking or driving through a specific area. The drive through area was supposed to feel like you were on a safari adventure. This amusement park had 70 different species of animals from all around the world. However, there were constant rumors of animals escaping from the park or illegal poachings happening. This, of course, damaged its reputation. But that's not what caused the park to close. It said that Warner Bros wanted to make the park bigger, but the residents of the area were not too fond of this idea. In 1976, the park shut down and all the animals were rehomed. However, after the park was closed, frozen remains of several animals were found on the premises, making them wonder what went on there behind the scenes. Moving on at number six, we have Bedrock City. Who here grew up watching the Flintstones? Man, that is such a classic cartoon. Back 
Back in the 70s, a Flintstones themed amusement park was opened in Williams, Arizona. It had rides such as a giant brontosaurus shaped slide, character statues, and a Flintstones themed diner. It also had a campground if you wanted to stay overnight. But recently, the park changed owners, and well, the new owner had new plans for the park. The park was recently closed just last year, and now this owner plans to make it into a new attraction called. Raptor Ranch. Can't lie, it sounds pretty cool. But for now, the park is abandoned and all that's left is a cutout of Wilma standing near the entrance. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Hobbiton. Hobbiton was an amusement park centering around J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. Now, you think that this park would be a huge success since the books were, but nope. It wasn't. Built in the 1970s, this attraction didn't have any rides or games, but instead it was more of like a nature walk, where you could just walk through scenes from the book. And I think that one of the reasons why this park failed was because people want rides and games, something to, you know, like interact with. At this park, you would walk through the story of Bilbo Baggings, and each set had a voice box that would tell you what was going on in the scene that you were viewing. But it was a failed project and ended up closing in 2009. But if you pass by the area, you can still see a sculpture of Gandalf at the door of Bilbo Baggins' hobbit hole. Coming in at number four, we have Chippewa Lake Amusement Park. This amusement park was operational for a hundred years before closing down. It opened in 1878 and was the hot spot for family fun. In fact, its ferris wheel was said to be the fastest ferris wheel in America. I don't know if that's really an accomplishment though, like I can just feel the nausea just thinking about it. Sadly, the park closed down in 1978 because of low attendance. The park was left untouched for quite some time. Then in 2008, a fire destroyed many of the structures. The rest of the structures were demolished that same year. But people really need to stop burning down abandoned amusement parks. In our third spot, we have Prehistoric Forest. This amusement park had everything you could ever ask for. They had a water slide, a waterfall, a smoke volcano and dinosaurs. Lots and lots of dinosaurs. Built in 1963, this park was meant to mix fun with education. The park was divided into three areas. First, you had a safari train ride that would take you through the woods filled with 70 statues of dinosaurs and other prehistoric creatures. Then you had a walking tour led by a guide and you would learn more about the creatures. Lastly, there was another train which took you through the land of the leprechaun. I know, kind of seems weird like what do dinosaurs and leprechauns have in common, but this taught you legends from early Irish settlers of the area. The park even had a fossil digging pit, which is really cool, I would have loved that. And entry back in 1981 was only 275 for an adult and 175 for a kid. Man, I wish that's how cheap Disney's tickets were, because if that was the case, I'd be going like every month. Unfortunately, this park closed in 1999. In our second spot, we have Lincoln Park. And I'm not talking about the band here, or an amusement park based on the band. Lincoln Park was an amusement park located between New Bedford and Fall River in Massachusetts. In 1894, the Union Street Railway Company created Lincoln Park to connect Fall River to New Bedford. Lincoln Park was at the end of the trolley line and was originally created as a picnic park. It had picnic tables, a playground, and some grills to make your own food. Eventually, it transformed into an amusement park. It was originally named Midway Park or Westport Park, but was later changed to Lincoln Park. This park was known for its ride, The Comet, which was a 300 foot long wooden roller coaster. But in 1986, a fatal accident occurred on this roller coaster, which kind of scared a lot of people and they're like, mm, is it really as safe as you claim it to be? Then in 1987, another accident occurred on another roller coaster, but thankfully this time no one was injured. But the park was closed in 1987. Then in the 1990s, a series of fires destroyed 90% of the park and the rides. What's with all these parks catching on fire? Like seriously. 
Smokey the Bear is going to find out. Signing us off at number 10 is Dawson, New Mexico. If any of the ghost towns on this list have a tragic past, it is definitely Dawson. The mining town was bought by the Phelps Dodge Corporation back in 1906, and they're the ones who really built up the town, you know, putting in homes, facilities like hospitals, stores, a cinema, even a golf course. The city had 10 mines, and the place was booming with a population of 9,000 until disaster struck not once, but twice. In 1913, Canyon Mine Number 2 was shaken by an explosion in a neighboring town, and out of the 286 men who showed up to work that day, only 23 survived. Then, 10 years later, Canyon Number 1 had a mine car that derailed into timbers, and the electric trolley cable sparked, igniting the coal dust. A majority of the 123 men that died that day were children of men from the previous disaster. Parts of the city's population moved after each explosion, and the demand for coal also declined quite quickly. By 1950, the last mine in Dawson was closed, and the whole area was sold, and the structures demolished. The town was just kind of left to rot. What's especially creepy about it, though, is the 400 white crosses in Dawson Cemetery that symbolize the miners who died. Imagine not knowing it was an abandoned city and just going there and seeing that. You'd be like, huh? Filling on number seven slot is Mystic, South Dakota. And honestly, I low key just picked this one because of its name and that it reminded me of Mystic Falls from the Vampire Diaries. So, Mystic is one of the many ghost towns located in the Black Hills Mountain Range, and Native Americans have quite an extended history with the area. It was actually called Sitting Bull before it was called Mystic. The city wasn't even really a city. It started off as a Creekside camp in 1876 and somehow survived a really long time. Mystic's post office was built by 1885. Four years later, it had a railway line and a second one by 1906. The town started importing coal into the hills and exporting coal out of them. And the journey definitely wasn't easy. A bunch of floods happened, destroying a lot of their bridges and railway lines. The Great Depression screwed them royally. Their sawmill burned down, but they just kept bouncing back, and we like that never give up energy. I don't have it, but I like it. By the end of the Second World War, everything was going to sh and the mill was too expensive to operate, and then people stopped traveling there. The sawmill was closed, and so was everything else, and finally, the whole population was just gone. Now, at number six is Rhyolite, Nevada. Located right near the eastern part of the Death Valley National Park, this town got its start in 1905 as multiple mining camps just sprung up out of nowhere. It was the gold rush, so people were migrating to Rhyolite left, right, and center. The city had a lot to offer. It had resident hotels, an opera house and symphony, a hospital, a stock exchange, but the most appealing of all, its infamous red light district. Girls from San Francisco would get employed by the shops there, which was kind of like a delicacy, if you will. At its peak, the town had about 3,500 to 5,000 people, but it went down as quickly as it went up. The earthquake of 1906 and financial panic of the next year made money scarce and the mine stock value started crashing. They started closing down, which meant miners were also moving out of the town, and by 1920, the place was a ghost town. Coming in at number five, it's Kalapana, Hawaii. So this town is part of the Puna district of Hawaii, and fun fact, it was home to the infamous star of the sea painted church. Hawaii is such a volcanic cesspool, it literally has 15 out of the 129 that are part of the Hawaiian Emperor Seamount chain. In 1990, lava from the vent of Kilauea destroyed most of the town and its houses. Over 100 houses were buried in the lava flow as well as Kalapana Gardens. The church was moved so as to not perish as well. The flow was so bad that even two neighboring towns were destroyed and a new coastline was formed under the 50 feet of lava flow. By 2010, there was literally only 35 houses left, and now the town is closed because of new destructive lava vents. It just don't stop, do it? At number four is Virginia City, Montana. So this city was founded in 1863, and it was initially called Verena after the only first lady of the Confederate States, Verena Howell Davis. But the judge objected to that and called it Virginia City instead. It took a matter of weeks for the town to start booming, people coming from all over for the gold run. But this particular region had no justice system or law enforcement, yet it had a lot of wealth. And what happens when a place has no rules and a lot of money? A lot of sh Criminal activity was at an all-time high. Road agents were killing and robbing people on the roads everywhere. They killed more than 100 people in a year. At its peak, it had 10,000 people, but of course, when the gold ran out, so did the appeal of the city. By the 1940s, Virginia City had become a ghost town and was bought by Charles and Sue Bovee, who started maintaining the ruins, and by the 50s, it was good for tourism. Fun fact, the frontier woman Calamity Jane lived there as well. Woohoo! Filling on number three slot is Shanika, Oregon. Now, plot twist, unlike 
nearly every single town on this list, Shatnika wasn't a mining town. It was for ranchers and was once called the wool capital of the world. People started making camps wherever they could find water and it was actually initially called Cross Hollow and started properly booming at the start of the 20th century. The town was used as a transportation hub and was a centre of sheep, wool, wheat and cattle production. Their sales were like 3 and 4 million annually just for wool which is incredible. At the start of the 1900s there were two fires in the business district that ruined any extra hype about the city and that's what jump started it into decline. The place had been a ghost town since the 50s but all the buildings are still there. The hotel, Sage Museum, Shaniko School, the ice cream shop Goldies and more. Now at number 2 is Kennecott, Alaska. So this is more of an abandoned mining camp than it was a huge city but it was still kind of like a little town. Located next to Kennecott Glacier, a duo of prospectors travelled to the area in 1900 and found a bunch of malachite. The area had copper ores as well and by the next year the Alaska Copper Company took root and by 1905 things were going really well. There was a steamship line, a railway, a school, a hospital, tennis courts and a bunch of mines. Between 1911 and 1938 Kennecott produced 200 million dollars worth of iron ore. That is ridiculous. For a remote little town where the nearest bit of civilization is 60 miles away that is a lot of money. By the end of the 30s the place was deserted since mining profits had gone down and honestly it was too far away from everything and it just wasn't the vibe anymore. The population was 3 and those people served as the watchmen of Kennecott. And finally at number 1 is Garnet, Montana. I was so pissed I try not to repeat any states in this video and have it all be from different states but alas Montana is on here twice. Damn you America and your 50 states. The prospectors found the semi precious red gems there and gold which is where the city got its name from. The place was founded in the 1890s as a major commercial and residential area for mining and had around a thousand people living there by 1898. They had two barber shops, 13 saloons, a school, four hotels, a doctor's office. It wasn't really that bad to live in at all. The city became abandoned after the gold ran out but they would have left anyway since a huge fire broke out in 1912 and destroyed half the city. That part was never rebuilt again which is super eerie. Just imagine burnt ruins for half the town and just historical old buildings on the other side. There has to be some symbolism in that I'm sure of it. Ghana is now on the National Register of Historic Places and you can visit it, just don't move there. We're going to start the list with Waynesville, Ohio. This is said to be one of the most haunted towns in the state which is saying a lot for Ohio. Waynesville, Ohio is founded way back in 1797 and it has quite the history and its fair share of spooky stories. So sure folks flock here for the antiques and the annual sauerkraut festival but it's also known as a haunt for ghost hunters. You'll hear some odd sounds in the old buildings, you'll see shadowy figures peeking out of windows. With more than 15 spots rumored to be haunted, Waynesville has no shortage of creepy tales. Like the Hamill House Inn for example. Staff here have reported seeing a mysterious man in room 4 and some say a young salesman vanished there ages ago possibly meeting a dark end. Then there's the Stetson house where Louisa Stetson, Lyric, supposedly still roams. Dressed to the nines in old fashioned gear, there's also the former friend's boarding home, now a museum, where you might hear the sounds of ladies bustling about as if they're cooking up a storm even though there's no kitchen anymore. Now we move on to Mansfield, Ohio. This place isn't just said to be haunted by you know lame ghosts who will just pass right through your body if they ever try to punch you. It's it's also haunted by a big scary hairy orange eyed beast referred to as orange eyes and you wouldn't want to get punched by orange eyes. But let's start with the haunted stuff. One of the most famous haunted locations in Mansfield is the Ohio State Reformatory. Known for its imposing architecture and eerie atmosphere, once a prison the reformatory is said to be haunted by the spirits of former inmates who suffered under harsh conditions. Visitors have reported strange noises, apparitions and unsettling feelings while exploring it. And aside from the reformatory, Mansfield is also home to again tales of a cryptid known as the orange eyes. Described as a creature with glowing orange eyes and a menacing presence. Sightings of the orange eyes have been reported in the wooded areas surrounding the city. Some believe it to be a Bigfoot like creature. Others think it could be paranormal in some way. Some even believe it to be extraterrestrial in origin. Next up we have Boston Mills aka Helltown. This is kind of like the Chernobyl of Ohio. So Helltown, Ohio within the boundary of Boston Township is full and I do mean full of eerie legends and ghost stories. It was once a thriving community known as Boston Mills but this area faced an abrupt evacuation in the early 70s at the hands of the US government. 
purportedly to establish the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Now the empty homes, the abandoned buildings and desolate streets that are left behind have this eerie vibe about them. You see, some locals insist that the evacuation wasn't solely because of the government's land claim. There are stories about much darker reasons. Apparently there was toxic contamination with contaminants seeping into the soil. There are also stories about mutated animals and even people lingering around in the old abandoned homes. Not only that, but after the evacuation happened, there are said to have been satanic rituals carried out in the abandoned town. So, lots going on. Next up, we have Athens, Ohio, which has multiple haunted spots. There's a haunted abandoned asylum, a haunted cemetery, even the university is haunted. And there's more cemeteries, which are also all haunted. Every place in this town has ghosts. Half the population who lives here aren't even alive. Now, the haunted reputation mostly comes from its history with the former Athens Lunatic Asylum, now known as the Ridges, which is actually part of Ohio University's campus. The asylum's grounds still have old cemeteries where former patients were buried. One of the creepiest stories about the asylum is the story of Margaret Schilling. She was a former resident who died in the attic in 1979, and she was left there for so long that her decomposing body left a stain on the floor that remains to this very day. Wilson Hall, a dorm on Ohio University's campus, is rumored to be built on top of an old cemetery. The fourth floor of Wilson Hall is said to be haunted, with reports of apparitions, strange noises, and slamming doors. There's also a rumor about a student who took their own life in one of the rooms there. In addition to the Ridges and Wilson Hall, several cemeteries in the Athens area are rumored to be haunted, including Sims, Haynes, Hanning, Cuckler, Higgins, Zion, Hunter, Slaughter, quite the name for a cemetery, Cutler, Mansfield, and Peach Ridge Cemetery. Some say these cemeteries are actually arranged in the shape of a pentagram with Wilson Hall right at the center. Next, we have Kirtland, Ohio, which doesn't have much of a reputation of being haunted itself. What it does have, though, is a reputation for mutated creatures that are said to stalk the forests. Creatures known as melon heads. Deep within its dense forests are tales of the mysterious and eerie creatures known as the melon heads. According to local lore, the melon heads are said to be humanoid beings with these abnormally large bulbous hairless heads, resembling melons. I picture them kind of looking a bit like Hey Arnold, which would be a lot less cute in real life. Uh, these elusive creatures are rumored to lurk in the shadows of the forests, emerging only under cover of darkness to stalk unsuspecting travelers. Now, there are a few different versions of the Melon Head's tale, but the most well-known story or explanation for these creatures was that a mad doctor was conducting unethical experiments on a bunch of orphans. Experiments which caused their bulbous craniums to uh, take shape. At one point, the orphans got fed up with being experimented on, and they hated their melon bulbous dumb heads, and they banded together, killing the mad scientist before setting his home on fire and running off into the woods. Sightings and encounters of melon heads, though, continue to be reported to this day. Cleveland is also said to have some creepy paranormal stuff going on, mostly from the supposedly haunted Franklin Castle, which is said to be Ohio's most haunted house. The Franklin Castle is a towering structure with a dark and mysterious past. Built in the late 19th century, Franklin Castle has long been rumored to be haunted by restless spirits. Stories of tragedy, death, and mystery surround it. Legend has it that the castle's original owner, Haynes Tideman, suffered multiple personal losses within its walls, leading to rumors of curses and supernatural stuff going on. Pretty soon after his family moved in, Tideman's mother died, his sister then died of diabetes, and over the next three years, more and more of his siblings died prematurely. Only two of the six actually made it to adulthood, so it's really no wonder why the place is said to have some darkness lingering in it. Over the years, visitors and residents have reported strange sounds, apparitions, and unexplained phenomena within the castle. Despite renovations and changes in ownership, one thing has always stayed the same, the paranormal activity. Next up on the list is Put-In Bay. Now, Put-In Bay, Ohio may be known for its sunny shores and summer fun, but lurking beneath the surface, there's some creepy stuff going on. From what I've read, there are three major haunted hotspots. First up, we have the Park Hotel. This hotel has stood since the late 1800s, and it's seen its fair share of guests come and go. Also means there's a lot of history, some of it dark. 
Some visitors have reported more than just creaky floorboards and old fashioned charm. Rumor has it that the Park Hotel is haunted by the ghost of a young woman who tragically fell to her death from one of the upper floors. Guests have reported strange noises, flickering lights, and even sightings of a figure wandering the halls late at night. Next, there's the Dollar House, a Victorian mansion. Legend has it that the original owner, Valentine Dollar, was involved in some shady dealings during Prohibition, including smuggling alcohol and hiding it in secret passages throughout the house, and today visitors claim to hear whispers and footsteps echoing through the empty rooms, as if the ghosts of Dollar's past are still lingering within the walls. Then there's the Crew's Nest, a historic home that sits on a cliff overlooking Lake Erie. This mansion was once owned by Jay Cook a banker and financier, but there's a tragic tale of one of Cook's daughters that's left its mark on the property. The story goes that the young girl fell to her death from one of the windows, and her ghost is said to still haunt the grounds, appearing as a fleeting figure in white. Moving on to Marietta, Ohio next, a charming town that also has its fair share of ghost stories, and most of the scary stuff happens at Hotel Lafayette. This hotel was built in the late 1800s. Over the years, guests and staff report reported strange occurrences and unexplained phenomena while staying there, leading many to believe that the hotel is haunted by spirits. One of the most famous ghostly residents of the Hotel Lafayette is said to be a woman named Sarah, who reportedly took her own life in one of the rooms, and guests have reported hearing disembodied cries, footsteps, and even seeing apparitions wandering the halls late at night. Others have claimed to feel an eerie presence or sudden drops in temperature, but Sarah isn't the only ghost rumored to haunt the Hotel Lafayette. Some guests have reported encountering the spirit of a young girl who plays tricks on unsuspecting visitors by moving objects or flickering lights. A real brat of a ghost. But at least she's still having fun in the afterlife, so props to her. Next up we have another kind of Chernobyl-like Ohio small town, Cheshire. Only a handful of people still call this place home. At one time this was a bustling town, but barely anyone lives there at this point, and that's because of the environmental hazards caused by a nearby power plant. The plant emitted a thick sooty residue and chemical fogs that would blanket the town sporadically. Obviously not at all uh, safe for residents to live in that kind of condition, so many abandoned their homes and started new lives in other places. Eventually, the power company responsible for the pollution was compelled to just buy out the entire town. But finally, we have the abandoned town of Moonville. Love that name, Moonville. This is a ghost town with only a few traces left behind. A cemetery, some foundations, and a desolate railroad tunnel. But what sets Moonville apart are the chilling tales that surround its abandoned tunnel. Stories that have been passed down for decades. One of the most famous specters haunting Moonville is that of Theodore Lawhead, the unfortunate engineer whose spirit is said to roam the tracks. Back in the 1880s, Lawhead met a tragic end when his train collided head-on with another. Now visitors report sightings of a ghostly figure with a lantern in his hand pacing along the track and disappearing into the tunnel. Then there's the story of the Brakeman, a ghost believed to be that of a young man who met his demise after a night of heavy drinking. Legend has it that he fell asleep on the tracks, never to awaken again because he was too sauced to wake up before a train ran him over. Then there's the Lavender Lady. Some say they've seen a frail elderly woman walking near the tunnel only for her to vanish into thin air, leaving behind the lingering scents of lavender. Some say she's the spirit of Mary Shea, or Shay, who met her end on those very tracks. There's also the spirit known as the Bully, believed to be the restless spirit of Baldy Keaton, a Moonville resident who liked a good old fist fight. The tale goes that after a scuffle at the saloon, Baldy was found dead on the tracks. As for how he died, no one knows for sure, but now his ghost is said to loom above the tunnel, glaring at unsuspecting visitors and even pelting them with stones. We're gonna kick things off with Loveland. How on earth did I not put Loveland, Ohio in part one? Loveland is home to one of the strangest creatures said to stalk the state, the Loveland Frog. But it's also home to a supposedly haunted castle. Loveland Castle was constructed by Harry Andrews. A uh, very interesting man this guy was. He had a lot of interest in knights and medieval lore. Andrews was born in 1890. He worked as a medic during World War I. He then contracted meningitis during the war and was believed to be dead. His body was actually moved to the morgue, like he was done. 
But when his body was taken back to the hospital to be dissected, the doctors were like, hey, you know what, why not? Let's just see if we can get his heart beating again with adrenaline. Miraculously, it worked. Andrews, who'd now spent a whole bunch of time in Europe and then almost died, was now even more into medieval history and returned home with this newfound determination to build his very own castle. Eventually, he constructed Loveland Castle along the banks of the Little Miami River. Andrews then moved into the castle, where he lived until he died in 1981. Today, the castle is the headquarters for the Knights of the Golden Trail, an organization Andrews started dedicated to upholding the principles of knighthood, but Harry Andrews' spirit is said to still roam the castle grounds. Objects will mysteriously disappear or move, and voices are heard echoing through the corridors. And as I said at the top, of course, Loveland's supernatural reputation doesn't end with this castle. One of the most famous legends is that of the Loveland Frog, or frogs. There have been multiple large frog-like creatures spotted near the Little Miami River over the years. Next up, we have Ashtabula, which is said to be haunted by the spirits of a tragic train disaster. So on December 29, 1876, the Pacific Express No. 5 crossed the Ashtabula Bridge. But because of particularly cold weather and structural weaknesses, the bridge collapsed, sending the train plummeting into the icy river below. And in the end, 98 people died. The scene must have been absolutely horrific, with rail cars crashing into each other and igniting in flame. And firefighters were unable to put out the flames, so people just cried out in pain and horror as they were consumed by fire, trapped in the wreckage. It was one of the worst rail accidents in U.S. history, and the screams of those victims victims still haunt the area to this day. Some say you can occasionally hear them above the rush of the river. The Chestnut Grove Cemetery holds the remains of 19 of these victims, but their spirits are said to be very much active. Visitors to the cemetery have reported seeing ghostly apparitions. But along with the victims of the tragedy, there's also said to be the ghost of Charles Collins, one of the developers of the bridge. Witnesses claim to have seen his guilty spirit weeping at the sight of the tragedy or crying over people's graves. Some claim to see tiny lights even hovering below the new bridge where the old one once stood. Rogue's Hollow near Doylestown, Ohio has its fair share of spooky tales as well. It's said that a mill worker died in a pretty gruesome manner, getting crushed by the mill wheel, and now his spirit is said to guard the area, keeping outsiders at bay. Then there's the eerie tale of the headless horse and the ghost oak tree. So at one time there was a large oak tree near Route 65, and one of its branches hung so low that riders on horseback had to duck as they passed under it. Well, one story goes that the branch was weighed down extra low with ice, and a poor horse just ran into it at top speed, lobbing off its head. From that point on, riders passing the area late at night would occasionally come across a devilish figure riding a ghostly, headless horse. Next up, we have Oxford, Ohio, which has one of the coolest ghosts, a phantom motorcyclist. So the story goes that back in the 40s, there was this farmer's daughter. She was head over heels for this guy who was a bit of a James Dean type, leather jacket, motorcycle, very rebellious. Also a lot like me, minus the motorcycle, the leather jacket, and the rebellious part. His name was James, that's the similarity. And her father was not too thrilled about their relationship. He thought the guy was trouble, and he probably wasn't wrong. He forbade his daughter from seeing him. So to avoid her father's disapproval, they met up in complete secret, usually late at night when the coast was clear. And when it was, the girlfriend would flash the porch light three times as a signal for him to come over. Well, one night, the boyfriend decided he wanted to take their relationship to the next level and propose. He saw the three flashes and revved up his motorcycle, racing towards her house to pop the question. But as soon as he sped down the road, he lost control of his bike, crashing into a barbed wire fence. And ever since, people claim they've seen this mysterious light 
flickering in the distance along the road where he crashed, said to be the spirit of the phantom motorcyclist, still trying to reach his girl's house to ask for her hand in marriage. Next on the list is Chillicothe, where there were a series of mysterious disappearances between 2014 and 2015. Now, it all began in the spring of 2014 when Charlotte Trago vanished without a trace. Trago, uh, who had struggled with addiction, was a mother of two, and she remains missing to this day. Shortly after Trago's disappearance, another woman, Tamika Lynch, who was a friend of Trago's, went missing as well. Her body was discovered three weeks later by kayakers. It's pretty obvious there was foul play, but the official cause of her death was deemed inconclusive. Then there was the disappearance of Wanda Lemons in November of 2014. She's also never been found. On Christmas Day 2014, Shasta Hemelrick went missing. Her body was later recovered from the Scioto River. Authorities claim she took her own life, but her family, as well as many others, think someone took it from her. Then there was the disappearance and discovery of Tiffany Sayers' body in May 2015. Her remains were found in a creek covered by a sheet. And the final victim, Timberly Claytora's body, was found near an abandoned building. She died at the hands of a firearm. And the case just would have been handled completely differently if these women hadn't been battling addiction. That was the one thing connecting all these. They were all involved in that world. And there's just this kind of lax attitude when it comes to situations like this, unfortunately, where authorities are like, well, you know, they're part of that world. This is just what happens. So it really hasn't got the attention that it deserves. Now we move on to the town of Lancaster. Here, there used to be a home with an incredibly dark past, the Mudhouse Mansion. So the mansion's origins go back to the mid 19th century it was built as a grand estate for a wealthy family. But as time went on, the home fell into disrepair and eventually it was abandoned and left to decay. And over the years, all these urban legends started to form around it. One of the most infamous stories is that the family had actually died in the mansion. Some versions of the tale claim that they were killed by an unknown assailant. Others go that they'd been driven to madness by some sinister force lurking within the mansion's walls. The Mudhouse Mansion was even said to be the birthplace of Bloody Mary herself. The mansion was demolished in 2015, but some folks will still claim to see ghostly figures of the mansion's former residents wandering the grounds, forever trapped in a limbo between the worlds of the living and the dead. All right, one of the strangest unsolved mysteries in Ohio has to be the Circleville Letters case. Now I'm gonna paraphrase here because there's a lot of detail. We could probably do an entire video about this case alone, but I'll go over it. It all started in 1976. Residents of Circleville started receiving these unsettling, threatening letters containing all these intimate details of their personal lives. The letters were postmarked from Columbus, Ohio, but there was no return address. One of the receivers of these letters was Mary Gillespie, a bus driver. She was accused in one of these letters of having an affair with the school superintendent, and the letters just kept coming in from this unknown sender. Then Mary's husband, Ron, also became a target. He received a chilling ultimatum to end his wife's supposed affair or face dire consequences, death. Ron was found dead in his pickup truck after a mysterious phone call, which had seemingly confirmed his suspicion about the letter writer's identity. He'd left in his pickup truck with a firearm, but was found dead soon after having crashed into a tree. Now authorities ruled Ron's death an accident, but then the letters continued. A number of residents received letters saying that Sheriff Dwight Radcliffe, who had investigated Ron's death, had been involved in a cover-up. At one point, this mysterious writer even planted threatening signs along Mary Gillespie's bus route, one of which she went to take down, only to find out it had been booby-trapped. If Mary had pulled the sign down in a particular way, a small pistol would have fired at her. Now, one man was arrested, Paul Freshor, but it's never been 100% verified that he was behind these letters. Eventually, he got out on parole. Case is still a mystery to this day. In the Hills and Dales Metro Park in Kittering, Ohio, there's a structure 
with a very shadowy past, the Haunted Witch's Tower, also known as Frankenstein's Castle. It was completed in 1941, and this 30-foot tall tower was constructed by boys with the National Youth Administration using salvaged stone. Its purpose was to provide panoramic views of the community country club, with its lookout platform offering vistas stretching up to 15 miles. But because of how remote the tower is, a lot of young hooligans started flocking there in the 60s. Graffiti covered its walls, and bottles of liquor and beer cans littered the grounds. Even shingles torn from the roof and glass bottles became ammo for attacks on passing cars below on Pearson Boulevard. Then in 1967, during a thunderstorm, a young woman named Peggy Harmison sought shelter inside the tower with her boyfriend, Ronnie Stevens. Bad move. Lightning struck the tower, killing Peggy instantly. Her body was found on the 11th step, half covered in severe burns. Ronnie survived, but he was found in a state of uncontrollable shock, apparently running around screaming. And ever since that night, there have been stories about the ghost of Peggy haunting the tower. All right, let's switch things up with a haunted golf club. You don't hear about haunted golf clubs very often. Legend has it that in the 60s, a bride fell from a balcony at Oakhurst Golf Club in Grove City, Ohio. And her ghost is said to haunt the establishment to this very day. One of the most frequently reported sightings involves the ghostly figure of a woman dressed in white, believed to be the ghost of the bride. The upstairs kitchen, located near the ballroom where events are held, is said to be a hotspot for paranormal activity. Employees have reported hearing unexplained sounds of pots and pans clanging and knocking late at night, only to discover that items have been mysteriously rearranged by morning. All right, we're finishing things off today with, with Minerva. It all began in August of 1978, when the Caton family reported encountering a strange creature near their home. According to the Catons, they were enjoying a quiet evening when they heard unusual noises coming from outside. They came face to face with this towering ape-like creature standing over seven feet tall. The creature reportedly had shaggy dark fur covering its body, it had glowing red eyes, and emitted this foul odor. The Catons quickly ran back to the safety of their home and phoned the cops. In the days that followed, all these other sightings of a mysterious creature were reported by other residents of Minerva. Witnesses described similar encounters with a large, hairy beast lurking in the shadows, but none of the stories were scarier than the Catons, who said the creature returned to their property several times, hurling rocks at their home, staring at them through their kitchen window, and even killing their dog. It's uh, one of the most violent Bigfoot cases ever reported. We're starting things off with Miamisburg in Montgomery County, which has some pretty spooky spots, including an Arby's. All kinds of disturbing stuff is said to go on at this fast food joint. Employees closing up for the night alone have said they've heard laughter coming from the basement, only to find no one there. Some will also report having their hair pulled by some unseen force. There's also a ghostly man who sometimes is seen staring into the oven during opening or closing hours. He'll Grove Cemetery is probably the most well-renowned haunted hotspot in this town, though some visitors will say they see a young girl crying over a grave. But when approached, she'll just stare at you for a moment before vanishing into thin air. There's also the grave of a preacher's daughter who took her own life after being disowned by her family. A Bible was said to have sat on her grave, with stories of it appearing broken one instant but then perfectly fine the next. Next up is East Liverpool, which is home to a couple haunted parks, a haunted cemetery, and of course, a haunted phone booth. As silly as a haunted phone booth might sound though, uh, the story is actually pretty spooky. So apparently a young man was killed in the area and his ghost haunts the street that he died on. Some will say that on some nights, especially Saturdays during the month of March, passersby will hear ringing coming from the booth. And if you answer the phone, you might just hear a somber, ghostly voice on the other end telling you to look across the street. And if you do, you just might see a headless young man waving before vanishing 
into the shadows. Now we move on to Sandusky, Ohio, which has a few notoriously haunted spots. One is the Sandusky County Historic Jail and Dungeon. This place, which was built in the 1840s, is no longer a jail or a dungeon, or I guess it technically is a dungeon and a jail, but it's just not operating as one. There are tours of the place, though, and the staff and many people who visit claim to have experienced some pretty eerie stuff. Something that's said to happen every so often has to do with the courthouse security system. So sometimes at around two or three in the morning, the motion alarm just goes off, detecting someone or something outside the dungeon door. Whatever it is will then make its way up the steps to the first floor of the courthouse. Now I say whatever it is because when security cameras get checked, there's usually no one in the footage. But on rare nights, there is a shadowy figure with a brimmed hat seen spotted sitting on a bench outside the courthouse. The fire alarm has also been known to be pulled even when nobody's near it. Whatever spirits are haunting this place, they seem to really enjoy loud, obnoxious noises. And on top of all that, you also have your typical disembodied sounds like voices and footsteps when there's nobody else around. We're going to stay in Sandusky for a bit though and talk about Cedar Point. Cedar Point is one of the most popular amusement parks in the US, but it also has a bit of a dark side. When we think of haunted theme parks, it's usually the abandoned ones where we picture all the paranormal stuff going on, but Cedar Point is still very much open. It was built in 1870 though, so it's been around for a while, and any theme park that old has definitely had its fair share of horrific accidents. Get it? Fair share theme park? All right. One of the most haunted attractions was the Frontier Town Carousel, which is no longer there, but people would often claim to catch a glimpse of a ghostly woman riding one of the horses. She's said to be the wife of the man who carved the horses on the carousel. He'd killed her after finding out that she was cheating on him with a jockey. So now her spirit is attached to the carousel, coming out at midnight to ride a fake horse every full moon, which she's probably not too plussed about. For a woman who really seemed uh, to like being around horses, a wooden one probably just doesn't cut it. Not to mention uh, that she's stuck in a, a pretty boring ride that was built by the dude who shot her to death. So there's also that. Next on the list we have the town of Wooster. You thought the haunted Arby's was intriguing? Try the haunted Pizza Hut in this town. Yeah, you can't even grab a slice of pizza in Ohio without something paranormal or weird happening. I'd love to do a road trip through Ohio visiting every haunted fast food restaurant, actually. You could, could call it like Fast Frights Ohio tour or something. So this Pizza Hut is part of a big plaza that was all built over the grounds of a former insane asylum. So there could be some lingering spirits in the area, most of whom seem to really stick to the Pizza Hut. There's also a Taco Bell in the plaza, which some paranormal stuff is said to go on, but there's not as many stories about that place because because there's probably like five people who go to who goes to Taco Bell, especially when you have a Pizza Hut right there. I'm gonna get tons of comments now from like like Taco Bell fans being like Taco Bell's the best. I don't know. I just think it's kind of mediocre. Staff at the Pizza Hut, though, have seen figures vanish into the walls. One manager who was closing up for the night was startled to hear footsteps following her, and then turned around to see nothing but a white mist hovering in the air. Marietta and Washington County. This town is probably most well known for Anchorage Mansion, which is said to be very haunted. It was built by Douglas Putnam for his wife Eliza in the 1800s, but it's said Eliza died shortly after moving in. And people claim to have seen her ghost wandering around or peeking out of windows. Later on, the mansion was turned into a nursing home where residents also reported seeing Eliza's ghost. Some say there are secret tunnels under the mansion as well, maybe from the Underground Railroad, but nobody really knows if they're haunted as well, but I'm, it's Ohio, so I'm, I'm presuming they are. Marriott is also home to a haunted comfort inn where the televisions are known to turn off and on by themselves, doors open and close on their own, and guests will occasionally wake up 
with the feeling of cold hands on their body, luckily to find that no one is there in the room with them. I'd, I'd rather have a ghost in my room than a chilly intruder. Again in Washington County we have the village of Fredericksburg, which is home to Robin Industries, which does custom molding for rubber and plastic components. It was formerly the Fredericksburg Pottery Site, which had a pretty dark past, and the building is rumored to be haunted by multiple spirits. There were two major tragic events at Fredericksburg Pottery Site, including two devastating fires and a fatal train accident that took the lives of 12 people. So employees at the site have reported some pretty eerie encounters, like feeling sudden cold spots. Now, I usually kind of roll my eyes when people say cold spots. It's like, all right, uh, spots cold, whatever. But these are extra strange because staff will report feeling them behind machinery that runs at extremely high High temperatures. One story involves the ghost of a man blamed for the train derailment who is said to show up in the mold room. In the shipping room, sightings of an older gentleman believed to be the former mayor who witnessed the tragic train accident have also been reported. Then there's the apparition of an elderly woman who's been seen swinging doors open and shutting off machinery. The stairwell leading to the office is said to be guarded also by a spirit, with one employee experiencing a strong stench and then a sudden gust of wind that nearly knocked her down the stairs. And unless someone was eating some bad burritos from Taco Bell that day, I think it might have been a ghost. So I know we've covered Dayton, Ohio already, but I didn't mention the Wright Patterson Air Force Base, which is said to be one of the most haunted spots in the state. It's even been featured on Ghost Hunters. One eerie story involves the ghost of a young Vietnamese boy believed to have perished in one of the museum's helicopters. Visitors have reported sightings of the boy wandering the museum grounds after dark. And of course, then they go up to talk to him, and he's not actually there. It's not just some kid who like ran into the place. There's also a German World War II fighter plane said to be inhabited by the ghost of its pilot. Visitors claim to have seen the pilot waving from the plane's window. Seeing as it's the ghost of a German World War II fighter pilot, though, I'm not sure if what he's doing is actually a wave. The helicopter named Hopalong is said to be haunted by a pilot who met a tragic end, with staff reporting sightings of him desperately flipping switches in a futile attempt to escape. The Black Maria, known for its secret missions during the Vietnam War, is also said to be haunted by the spirits of soldiers who died on board. The boxcar plane, famous for dropping the atomic bomb on Nagasaki, is also rumored to be haunted by a young boy who is said to dart past it during the night. Haunted inns, always a staple of small villages, and Granville in Licking County, Ohio, has one of its very own, the Buxton Inn. This place dates back all the way to 1812, so plenty of history with this place. Even Abraham Lincoln stayed here, and some of those who were escaping from the Underground Railroad stayed here at one time as well. So with all the people who have passed through the doors and slept under this roof, all the history surrounding the building, it probably comes as no shock that some energy is said to linger within the inn. Not only do you have the spirits of past guests who have long since passed, but even former deceased employees are said to have never fully left. Like one of the previous owners, Ethel Bonnie Houston, for example, who's become known as the Lady in Blue. Several guests have claimed to see a woman in a blue dress roaming the hallways, only to walk right through closed doors or just vanish into thin air altogether. Some have also smelt cigar smoke out of nowhere before spotting a man who also vanishes into thin air. This is said to be the ghost of the inn's founder, Major Buxton. And we're to finish things off with Loudonville in Ashland County. This place is known for its two supposedly haunted spots, one of which is a hotel, the other a park. First, there's Mohican State Park, which is said to be haunted for a couple different reasons. Mainly though, there used to be an asylum on the land in the 1800s, which might help explain some of the ghostly stuff going on. Witnesses have also reported seeing a mysterious light in the park for over two decades. Then there's Landel's Mohican Castle, which is actually a hotel and a damn cool looking one too. Looks like something you'd see in Norway. It was built on the grounds of a former English slash German church. The story goes that in the late 1800s, a dispute over language during worship services led to the church mysteriously burning down after the Germans decided to relocate their relatives' graves. Since the current owners acquired the property in 1991, a series of unexplained fires have just been plaguing the place, including the destruction of a book factory in 92 and an on-site restaurant in 2007. Some believe the land is just cursed, with guests reporting sightings of a girl in blue
blue in the graveyard and hearing crying in the cemetery and pool building, people will also claim to see Civil War era soldiers in their rooms. And we're starting off the list with the town of Holman in Wisconsin. This small village has a story about one of the wildest cryptids in the United States, the man bat. Unfortunately, it's not Batman. This is a large half man, half bat looking creature, far less friendly. Actually, there is a man bat in the actual Batman. It's a bit more like that, the villain, the scary monster guy. So this story goes, then on a September night in 2006, a father and son had a terrifying run-in with what they described as a man bat while driving down Briggs Road at night. Traveling in their truck, the pair spotted a massive figure hurtling towards them in the darkness. The father swerved to try and avoid colliding with the thing, and the creature abruptly changed course, flying up into the sky with a piercing shriek. Now immediately afterward, both men were overcome by this sudden and severe illness, forcing them to pull over and vomit. Now some say that has something to do with the creature. I don't know, it was maybe emitting something into the air. I just think they saw something really wild and it was overwhelming. I, I'd probably be barfing after seeing something like that. A giant winged creature flying towards my car. I almost just died. They described the creature to authorities saying it was six to seven feet tall with leathery bat-like wings, clawed appendages, and glowing yellow eyes. Some speculate that this bat creature could somehow be linked to the infamous Mothman, or that it's potentially even just the same creature. Next up, we've got Saxtown, more like Axtown, a small town located just outside of Milstadt in Illinois. In 1847, the town was comprised of mostly German immigrants, and on March 19th of that same year, one of them, Fritz Stelzeride, was killed. After responding to a knock on the front door of his farmhouse, he was struck down with an axe. The killer then entered the home and killed his father, his mother, his grandfather, and his siblings, all with the same weapon. The bodies were found by Stelzeride's neighbor who got suspicious when he didn't see anyone working on the farm that day. He discovered the disheveled bodies with their throats gouged from end to end. No one knows who the killer was or what their motivation was for ending the lives of an entire family in such a gruesome way. One theory, however, is that the family had been hiding gold on the property, but this was never proved because the existence, or the absence, of the money was never proved. Another theory is that a family member did the killing so that they would become the sole heir to the inheritance. A theory backed by the fact that after the killings, the one remaining member of the family who had not been on the farm that day, as far as we know, fled the country and changed his name. But again, if someone is targeting Stell's rides, it's probably best not to be one. So his logic uh, could come from somewhere else. Moving on to Woodland Park in Teller County, Colorado. Now, we have a very unsettling and tragic case involving a young man named Joshua Maddox. So in 2008, a man named Chuck Murphy was demolishing his old wood cabin when he came across something incredibly disturbing. It was the remains of Joshua Maddox, a young man who had been missing for seven years at that point. He'd been stuck in the chimney. Now, it's pretty obvious that he died in the chimney, but there's always been this mystery as to why he was in there in the first place. Joshua was last seen alive in May of 2008 when he left his family's home to take a walk, but he never returned. Joshua seemed to have vanished without a trace. Then, in 2015, he was found lodged in the chimney of the cabin. This was the last place anyone was expecting to find him, which is why he was found completely by accident. So now people were wondering what happened to him during those years that he was missing. Some think there may have been foul play involved, that someone had forced him into that chimney. Others think he'd just been maybe up on the roof of the cabin for whatever reason and then had an accident. Next up, we have the mystery of the Below killings, which took place in Windsor, North Carolina in 1993, back when the town had a population of just 4,000 people. So small, yes. Mysterious, also yes. On June 6, a man armed with various weapons entered the local Below grocery after hours. There were six employees in the building, all doing their closing duties when the man arrived, and using his handheld projectile 
weapon. He led them all into the meat cutting room in the back. He bound their hands with duct tape and then stacked the employees two by two before firing his weapons at all six. He then grabbed a meat cleaver and used it to impale the bodies numerous times again and again until the blade actually broke off into one of the victims backs. Super disgusting but surprisingly after the attack one of the victims was able to break free and call the police. Even more surprising three of the employees actually survived the attack as well. The surviving employees were able to give a description of the man to police but neither could figure out who committed the heinous crime, why and where they are now. But the police did say it was malicious and thought out. There's currently a $30,000 reward for any information that can lead to the arrest of the assailant so if you know anything give the Windsor North Carolina police a call and leave a comment. Next on the list is the Jamison family case. In October of 2009, Bobby Jamison, his wife Sherilyn, and their daughter Madison disappeared from their home in Oklahoma. They were last seen alive on their home surveillance system footage, making trips between their vehicle and their home, packing to leave in what authorities described as this very odd, almost trance-like state. Their abandoned truck was discovered days later in Latimer County, Oklahoma, with their malnourished dog inside and important belongings like their ID cards, their wallets, phones, a GPS system, and a large stack of cash. The family had been considering purchasing a plot of land nearby at the time of their disappearance, but it wasn't until November of 2013 that the skeletal remains of two adults and their daughter were found by hunters in a remote area of Latimer County, less than three miles from where the truck was abandoned. The remains were confirmed to belong to the Jameson family. The exact cause of death couldn't be determined because of how advanced the decomposition was. So the case is still completely unsolved. Next up, we have the mystery of the vanishing Iowa town of Urkhammer. In 1928, the town was small but thriving. It was well kept and growing. The grass was always mowed, the roads were always clean, and ever so often, new buildings would pop up as well. Pretty normal town, right? Well, things started to get weird when an aerial photo taken of the town painted an almost opposite picture of what could be seen from the point of view of someone on the ground. The town looked abandoned and disheveled. The grass looked overgrown and unkempt. A weird photo is weird, but many people did their best to believe that the image was the result of a messed up camera lens or something of the sort. But then things got weirder. During a road trip, an American man had stopped to fill up his gas tank in the town, but when he drove away, he realized that his tank had never been filled up, and so he drove back to get the gas that he paid for. He ran out of gas before he could reach the town, but he could see it, and it didn't look far, so he got out of his car and began walking, and walking, and walking. He never made it. No one knows what happened to the town. Some believe it chipped away bit by bit and others claim that it vanished into thin air out of the blue one afternoon. All right, next we have the case of Jessica Chambers. This one is pretty distressing. So this happened in Cortland, Mississippi. It's still one of the most baffling cases in the state. Just after 8 p.m. on December 6th, 2014, the body of a burning woman was found next to her car, which was also on fire. It was Jessica Chambers. She was still alive and told first responders that a man named Eric or Derek had set her on fire. She was rushed to the hospital where she died the following morning from her burns. Now here are the events that led up to her being found. She spent the morning with friends before heading to her mother Lisa's house where she took a nap. Later in the afternoon, she received a text message and left her mother's house, mentioning that she was going to grab something to eat and clean out her car. Around 5.30 p.m., Jessica was spotted at a gas station approximately a mile and a half from where her body would later be discovered. This was the first last confirmed sighting of her alive. Location data from her phone indicated that she'd traveled to nearby Batesville around 6 p.m. She returned to Cortland around 6.30 p.m. At about 6.45, she made a call to her mother, who noted that the call was unusually quiet. This was just 15 minutes before Jessica drove to the area where her body was found. At 7.30 p.m., she arrived at the location where, tragically, she lost her life about 30 minutes later. Nobody knew who this Eric or Derek could have been. Everyone, everyone with those names in the surrounding area was questioned, but they were all ruled out. The case is still a complete mystery. Next up, we have the Gurdon Light, which can be found in Gurdon, Arkansas, or Arkansas if you're James. 
He'll never live that down, guys. The light appears floating over the town's railroad tracks. It's eerie, ominous, and it glows a bright bluish white and sometimes has a bit of an orange tint. While the light might sound like some kind of ghost story or urban legend, it's actually not. It's a real phenomenon that occurs on a regular basis and that has been witnessed by hundreds of people, and maybe you if you decide to go visit. But still, no one knows why this light appears. There have been, of course, speculative ghost stories. Some people believe that one day, many, many years ago, a worker was killed on the train tracks and lost his head, and the light is the worker trying to find it again. Others believe he was killed by a co-worker with either a hammer or railroad spike, and some people believe in a much more scientific explanation. Kind of. Underground quartz crystals in the area that are under constant stress cause an electric reaction that results in the glow. Is that true? We don't know. There's not really a lot of scientific evidence to back the scientific theory up. Quotations, of course. The light is always there, but it's only visible at night. Some people believe it to be swamp fog, but that also doesn't make sense. Whole lot of theories for this one, but no real answers. If you have a theory, why not add it to the already very long list down below. Now we move on to Longview, Texas to discuss a mysterious entity that's said to lurk in the Gregg County Historical Museum. This eerie presence lurks on the second floor, where a century old iron coffin holds a haunting secret. Larry Corrington, a member of the board of directors, has spent a long time volunteering at the museum and, and has experienced some uh, pretty unsettling stuff. According to him, while he works downstairs, he sometimes hears this distinct sound of small footsteps echoing near the coffin upstairs, and he's not the only one who's heard them either. Other volunteers have also reported hearing these phantom footsteps. The origins of the iron coffin date back to the 1880s when it was discovered near downtown Longview. Inside the coffin were the remarkably preserved remains of a young girl. It's believed that she passed away while on vacation, and her family, unable to transport her body back home to West Texas, chose to lay her to rest in the iron coffin. Now, the girl's remains were reinterred at Greenwood Cemetery, but the coffin itself found its way to the Gregg County Historical Museum in 1980, where it's been ever since. Next up, we've got the Well to Hell, located in the back of an old graveyard in Sabatis, Maine. In 1956, it is said that a local boy had been dared by his friends to descend into the well. The young men were in high spirits, making jokes as their friend began his descent into the well. Well, they lowered him down using a rope, but when he reached the bottom, his friends assumed he would call up or yank the rope to signal that he wished to be lifted back out, but there was nothing. Just silence and no sign of movement. Eventually the friends took initiative and dragged the boy back up from the well, but as he emerged from the darkness, he looked like a completely different person. His hair had gone white, his eyes appeared as though they had lost what was human about them. It was like he had aged and completely changed in a matter of minutes, and not only that, but he had gone mad. He was unable to respond when his friends asked him what happened in the well. After the incident, he was confined to a mental institution and he never spoke another word ever again, but he would occasionally scream in terror. What happened in the well that day, no one knows, no one's been able to figure it out, what goes on down there, uh, but I think a pretty good theory is that it was, in fact, a well to hell. <music> 